and welcome to The Blueprint by Ballymore, the podcast that looks at how we can build better cities, speaking to urban innovators from around the world. I'm your host, journalist and broadcaster, Jonathan Openshaw, and in this episode, we'll be looking to a more sustainable future for our cities, scouring the world for best-in-class thinking. Now, when I mention the idea of green cities, you may imagine plentiful parks and living walls growing up buildings. And it is partly about green infrastructure, of course. But more than just injecting nature back into our designs, truly sustainable thinking is also about harnessing the best in new technology, rethinking entire systems of operation and nudging new citizen behaviours. Sustainability is a mindset then, just as much as an ecological toolkit. And truly sustainable cities are those being built to last. Balanced, smart and efficient. Now there's a huge problem that needs solving here. Cities are the powerhouses of our global economic growth, contributing around 60% of the world's GDP, and that's a fact that should be celebrated. However, they also account for around 70% of global carbon emissions and 60% of all resource use, while only covering 3% of our landmass. In short, although cities represent a tiny fraction of the world's surface, they create a vast majority of our waste. If we're to solve the environmental challenges that we now face in the 21st century, it's in cities that we need to find the solutions. The good news is there is plenty of innovative thinking going on around the world in this area, and we'll be starting this week's episode by looking to the vast East Asian metropolis for insight and inspiration. I'll be speaking to Agnes Queck, Design Ambassador for Design Singapore, about the city's secret to high-density sustainable growth. For us, we've sort of worked out this playbook over the past 50 years of our independence. And it really comes down to three things, I think. Lyndon Neri of Neri and Hu Architects in Shanghai will be sharing his learnings from shaping one of the world's mightiest East Asian megacities. These cities have to deal with rapid development and demolition at the same time. Given this growth and the intense pressure for people coming from rural areas and from villages to the cities, There needs to be a way in which the city deals with its periphery and its infrastructure. I'll be discussing the power of collective individual change in steering our sustainable futures with Hayden Wood of Bulb Energy. And so, so yeah, I think the way in which we fight the climate crisis, which is is an urgent fight, is to take personal action around energy consumption, the food we eat, the way we travel. And I'll be speaking to Ballymore Managing Director John Moryan, about how Mill Harbour represents a huge progression in sustainable design for the company. You know, particularly around how we use energy, particularly around how it creates energy. And I think that, for me, has been a bit of a quantum leap from where we were to where we're we're going. We've got a lot to cover in this week's sustainability special, so I'll waste no time and dive straight into my first interview with Agnes Queck, Design Ambassador for Design Singapore. The city-state of Singapore has set global benchmarks in terms of sustainable design, maximising their small landmass through an innovative combination of new tech and traditional greening. I started off by asking her how this balancing act is achieved. We're tiny, right? At a mere um, 742 square kilometres, you can fit about 888 Singapore's within the size of France, which is where I currently live. But with a population of 5.8 million, we're also a really dense city. So being an island city, basically 100% of our population lives in an urban environment. So when you take all of that together, it means that, number one, the key governing principle of our urban planning, design and architecture is based on one thing, which is severe land constraints. Yet at the same time, we have also been ranked as um, Asia's most sustainable city in 2018 by, by different indexes, such as the Sustainable Cities Index and Mercer's Quality of Life. So I think the question that we're really trying to answer here is how do you make all of that economic activity and population density happen in a really small space but maintain a high standard of sustainability, right? And for us, we've sort of worked out this playbook over the past 50 years of our independence. And it really comes down to three things, I think. Number one, it's a clear government policy in urban planning. The second is 
continuous innovation in architecture and technology. And the third is participation of the community. So in short, it's really down to the three Ps, the public, the private and the people. It's amazing that in a um, in a city state that's 100% urban, you can create such a profound connection with nature. Um, but more than this, it also seems to underpin the whole kind of R and D strategy um, of Singapore and kind of much higher up in the um, in kind of industry as well. Why do you think it runs so deep um, in the Singaporean nation state? Singaporeans were taught to treasure very scarce natural resources. And I remember in the early days when I was growing up, this approach was uh, rather didactic. They would turn off the household taps for one full day every year uh, so that we don't get water in our house. And instead, we have to line up at public taps with um, buckets to collect water. But that really, obviously, it, it sat with me because I'm still talking about this now 30 years on. It, it really imprints into you how difficult these natural resources are to come by. I think luckily our approach has evolved a lot by now. So instead of telling top down, we, we actually draw people towards appreciating water by building um, biophilic res water reservoir parks. We allow kayaking, canoeing for people to um, enjoy water and we invest in community gardening groups around the neighbourhoods. When Singapore first became independent in 1965, our first Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew had this really clear vision that we would become a garden city. And this to quote him, he said, after independence, I searched for some dramatic way to distinguish ourselves from the other third world countries. I settled for a clean and green Singapore. Which means that already from the get-go, when we knew that there are all these land users that we had to cater for, you know, for living, for commercial, for industry, uh, for military, yet at the same time, this green policy was very much already embedded at the front and the fore centre of our urban planning. So what it meant was a couple of things. Firstly, we have to insist that our urban um, environment has to be clean and designed um, lusciously with a lot of green. We had to find a way to maintain nature amidst all the high rise. And it could only mean one thing, that we have to build upwards and downwards. So this is about making the best use of land, which then allows us to also maintain a lot of nature. So in an island that is actually smaller than metropolitan New York, we have over 300 parks and four nature reserves. So that's about urban planning. And it's this kind of environment that then seeds um, the role of the private sector in terms of its continuous innovation in architecture. So Singapore-based architects are known regionally for their ability to combine this space efficiency with innovative ways of introducing greenery vertically, also called um, vertical greening. And I'll give you two examples. One is the Oasia Hotel, where the hotel has been designed from day one to be this living tower of creepers that will over time change with the facade of the hotel as the plants grow. Um, the second example is a residential tower, which is public housing project called Skybill at Dawson. It is over 40 storeys high, but it introduces sky gardens at every 11th storey because it's a way of connecting people who live really, really high up back to nature. It's such a fascinating glimpse into the um, future of high density, kind of high rise urban living and how we can make that sustainable. Looking to your own future, looking to the future of Singapore, where, where do you think the kind of trends are pointing and what, what, what do you think the future holds for Singapore itself? I think we are already in the future and um, it's perhaps no coincidence that uh, Westworld for their season three is set in Singapore. And to quote one of the co-creators of Westworld, Lisa Joy, she was talking to Danish architect Björk Engels and asking him where should we do our next filming? And Björk Engels said, come to Singapore and check it out because this is really about designing what, what the future would look like. Uh, one of the people that I, I'm very fortunate to consider as my mentor, Tim Brown, the chairman of IDEO, he told me once that Singapore is the closest thing to a spaceship on Earth because you can really design just circular systems in a closed loop, recycling resources, uh, making the most optimal use of them. Where we hope to be is to provide all these solutions to the really fast-growing second and third-tier cities um, around the Asia and the Pacific. 
And I think that、um, this is going to be one of the key demographic trends that will shape the 21st century. So that overall, we can be a much more sustainable region. We can tackle climate change together. It is a huge global problem that、um, transcends just one country. So we really need a sort of global solution and a view to that. That was Agnes Quek of Design Singapore Council talking about the importance of exporting the city-state solutions to the wider region. Now, with a population of just 5.8 million and a high national income, Singapore is able to push sustainability standards in bold new directions. But if the fight for the future well-being of our cities is to be won, it's on the mega cities of tens of millions that we really need to focus. And few cities come more mega than Shanghai, with a population of well over 24 million people. Architect Lyndon Nery is based there, where he co-directs the international practice Nery and Who. And I started off by asking him if the East Asian megacity can give us a glimpse into the future of how we'll all be living by the end of this century. I'm not so sure. I really am not so sure. It really depends on how these growing East Asian mega cities、uh, deal with the, their periphery and the rural areas that's around them. How they rethink. How they replan. Um, these villages in Shanghai and other fast-growing East Asian cities like Bangkok, Singapore, and Hong Kong. These cities have to deal with rapid development and demolition at the same time. Given this growth and the intense pressure、uh, for people coming from rural areas and from villages to the cities, there needs to be a way in which the city deals with its periphery. And its infrastructure. If it doesn't do that, I'm not so sure if it will become a model for future cities. So, what are some of the examples of、um, this planning going right? Then, it's kind of Chinese developments which really blend past, present, future, balance the city with the rural periphery.、Um, I know there's quite a lot of buzz around Shenzhen at the moment and the quite innovative. Approach there, which very much focuses on the kind of constituent villages and mixed-use amenities and local neighbourhoods in quite a bold new way. And I know you're also involved heavily in that. Can you say a bit about the Shenzhen model and what kind of sets that apart? The rapid transformation of Shenzhen from a small fishing village to a global urban centre started 40 years ago. Today, the skyscrapers that line Shenzhen's CBD or Central Business District still stand. But the government realized, in order for this growth to be sustainable, they need to start rethinking about the old villages or old neighborhoods that used to be thriving before the skyscrapers were built. The city has started an initiative by asking a number of developers to reimagine urban spaces. Some of these villages have population of ten to thirty thousand people. By adding programs like art center, hotels, community center, and many other public amenities, the city allows the village to survive and at the same time create micro self-sustaining villages that supports the mega cities. We find this initiative and this experimentation to be quite interesting from the government sector. It also allows all these micro self-sustaining、uh, villages. To have a life of its own, and at the same time, it entails that the villages survive. That was Shanghai-based architect Lyndon Nery highlighting the importance of nurturing the past as well as the future when planning cities, making sure that life can thrive on a neighbourhood or village level. Coming back to the UK now, one of the major challenges we face when it comes to creating more sustainable cities is the energy efficiency of our homes. Not only does the UK have a pretty outdated housing stock compared to many countries, with drafty Victorian homes leaking heat like sieves, but the market also has traditionally been dominated by legacy utility providers who have been slow to shift to more sustainable sources of gas and electric. One company setting out to change that is London-based Bulb, which was only founded in 2015 but already supplies 1.7 million homes across the UK, France, Spain, and Texas with sustainably sourced energy. A meteoric rise that has made them the fastest-growing company in Britain for the last two years, and they've now got their sights set on supplying 100 million homes over the next decade. I spoke to co-founder Hayden Wood about the company's vision, 
and started off by asking him what he set out to change with Bulb. Back then, when we when we when we started, we we were unhappy customers ourselves. Um, we saw lots of lots of other energy customers who didn't understand their bills, didn't trust their energy supplier, felt like they were paying too much, weren't very happy with the customer service they were receiving. And we also thought that energy was going to go through this this big change from from uh, electricity being generated in massive power stations and then shipped quite a long way over the grid into people's homes to a system where homes would be much smarter, they would have a smart meter, they would have solar panels and potentially an electric vehicle parked outside and there would be a heat pump in the home and, and homes would become to be a much more active node within the energy network. And so with the idea of using modern technology to run an energy supply business and give members, like, give customers really good service and give them really low prices. Um, we also thought that we could uh, help make homes much, um, much smarter over time and help people make decisions about how to make their homes more energy efficient in order to lower their bills and lower their carbon emissions. Okay, so partly customer experience and then partly this, you know, huge global challenge of um, climate change. Looking at climate change, can you give us some insight into the, you know, big question, but give us some insight into the actual scale of the challenge that we're facing here and, and you know, why it's been so hard to galvanise um, different interest groups behind it? It's quite large, John, I would say. It's a big, it's a big challenge. Um, I think it's, it's widely understood to be the one of the single biggest, you know, uh, existential threats that, that that we all that we all face um i think one of the one, one of the things that really struck us when we were um in the early days of, of looking at bulb was was just how many people knew about the climate crisis knew about um the temperature change that we need to avoid in order to uh, prevent ice caps melting and water levels rising and millions and millions of people being displaced and all of the geopolitical implications from that. But they didn't know, and, and they knew that we need, that in order to fight that climate crisis, you know, we need to reduce carbon emissions. But then a lot of individuals didn't know how they did that themselves. So one of the things that, that we do with Bob, obviously, is we supply renewable energy to people's homes. That's back in 2015, that was more than half of your personal carbon emissions in the UK came from your energy consumption at home. That's now down, thankfully, because of there are many more renewables, that's now down to about 40% of your personal carbon emissions come from your energy usage. Um, so what we've, what we've wanted to do is make it pretty simple what consu- like how consumers can reduce their emissions. And I think we're only going to avoid the climate crisis if people take action. And I, I'm, I always get a bit upset when I see people and companies making commitments because it's all very well making a commitment but you actually need to take action now we're sort of running out of time here um and so so yeah i think the way in which we fight the climate crisis which is you know is an urgent fight is to take personal action around energy consumption the food we eat the way we travel i think one of the really interesting things right now about um about this is that businesses, I think, have a much more active role to play in, in how we fight the climate crisis as well. Um, so I think there's there's a growing movement amongst some more progressive companies to measure their carbon emissions, both their direct carbon emissions, but also their indirect carbon emissions. I think one thing that's often the case for individual consumers is, you know, we everyone knows that there's a challenge here, but it's often the magnitude of the challenge, the sheer scale of it, makes action feel impossible or futile. Can you spell out how individual action can help? And so, for example, what would a whole scale shift to renewables do in terms of tackling the challenge? I guess there's two ways of, of looking at it. One is just di- like the direct influence of your own personal behaviour. So if you if you switch to if everyone in the UK switched to a renewable energy supplier, that would reduce the UK's carbon emissions by about forty percent. That that's that would be the the direct result of that. So if people are switching just for themselves, that they are one of I don't know like sixty five million people in the UK, but that is that will have a direct effect. 
There's then a, a, a system change that occurs as well. When you get large numbers of people making these changes, you, you will get all sorts of industries that will emerge around this thing. So, so if, if, for example, um, we had many, many more people looking at the energy efficiency of their homes and installing heat pumps, of course you would be installing a heat pump in your own home, but then also you would have a, a, a sort of a new industry develop of engineers who are installing their heat pumps and new heat pump manufacturers and those the heat pumps would become more efficient, they would become cheaper so more people could then install them in their homes. Um, and that's where that's the second piece around it, it's the, the way the, the sort of system changes. And so I think if an individual is thinking about what things they can do, there are things that they can do that will have a direct influence right now, but they will also have an effect on speeding up the system and bringing about the more, the more systemic changes if they do that. So I guess what you're saying really is it is about systemic change, both in terms of you know, individuals and the trickle down effect of the change in their um, consumption decisions, but also the, syst- the systemic change of the, all the different stakeholders involved in kind of you know planning our future cities. I think so, and I, th- I was really struck by I've read quite a few books by Stuart Brand, and I was really struck by this idea that he he had a, in one of his books on you know buildings around pace layers um, and how th- like different things move at different speeds. So fashion moves very quickly, you know, every every few months, whereas architecture moves a little more slowly because it just takes longer to build a building than it does to um, manufacture a garment. And I think one of the really interesting things that we're, that, that we're facing with the climate crisis is, is this challenge of pace layers. So it's relatively fast for people to change their cars because you, you know people replace their car every, every few years. It's much slower to improve the energy efficiency of our housing stock, which in the UK is really quite bad. And there was other countries around the world which have more modern homes and are much, much more energy efficient than the homes we have in the UK. But again, I think this is something where technology is coming into play. That was Hayden Wood, co-founder and CEO of Bulb Energy, talking about the nature of systemic change in transitioning to a more sustainable future. Now, Mill Harbour is set to be Ballymore's most sustainable project yet, bringing together learnings from decades of developments into one innovative offer. From air source heat pumps to all-electric combustion-free energy, not to mention plentiful parkland and forest, Mill Harbour is already on track to be a carbon-neutral operation. I spoke to Ballymore's Group Managing Director, John Moryan, about the need for a more layered approach to sustainability. You know, again, you talk about sustainability. I mean, you know, part of sustainability is is by by building these you know high density schemes in locations where people don't have to ver- travel very far necessarily to get to their work. We have a lot of facilities on, on site which you know encourage people to stay in the local area. You know, there are schools on site, which means the school run in this particular project is doesn't need to, you don't need to go to car or on a train. So, I mean, just by the very nature of of, of high density city centre living um, it's a much more sustainable way to live um, than necessarily living in an area where you have to travel reasonable distances to get to your school or to get to get to your job or to get to your, go and buy your, your, your groceries or whatever um, so I think um, you know this is the kind of development that um, that you know that, that this kind of high density development is the right solution for um, for how we're going to house people uh, in the future to kind of uh, to, to be as sustainable as possible. The, for me, one of the big achievements on Mill Harbour has been, you know, we're able to achieve a zero emissions on site. And that's been something that for us, to be honest about it, we've been quite frustrated with for some time that, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're effectively creating energy centres on site that are emitting... Um, emissions, you know, in the middle of a city, which doesn't intuitively kind of feel like the right thing to be doing. And I think policy has changed fairly dramatically over the last few years. And what it's allowing us to do is to build these developments with having no emissions on site, which I think for people living in a city 
is you know hugely positive and I think with you know what's happening with cars and more electric cars on the roads if we can make our buildings zero emission that means the the immediate environment within cities is just going to be so much better for everybody uh, so th- th- you know there's been a lot of achievements on Mill Harbour but that's the one I'm particularly proud of that I think um, achieving that has been something that we've been trying to do for a long time uh, but we finally managed to do it on this project and then so obviously the kind of energy system is quite groundbreaking that way what what in terms of the way that the actual buildings are designed um you know is it kind of minimizing heat leakage and what other areas are it's a kind of breaking new ground for mill harbour so i think um i mean a couple of things i mean inherently within the architecture i think the um the buildings uh like little things like the you know, the side-facing apartments tend to have um, long linear balconies. So they provide natural shading. Not alone are they providing, obviously, lovely amenity space for people living in those apartments, but they provide uh, natural shading for uh, the, the apartment below. So uh, in terms of your heat buildup in, 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 in your, your, your building tends to be a lot lower uh, when you have shading like that. So that's just something inherently within the architecture that makes the building uh, more efficient. The, the the buildings are incredibly airtight, so how we build buildings today versus how we built them maybe 10, 15 years ago, it mean that the amount of energy it takes to, to heat or to cool the building, just by the nature of the fact you're controlling the environment, again in this particular development is 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 again breaking new ground in terms of how we do that and then just final question um mill harbour i guess brings together a lot lots of different thinking um that ballymore's kind of developed over the last few decades with various different developments in the sustainability space do you see it as a kind of um this is the kind of like laboratory of future sustainability for ballymore is this something which will stand as a kind of um blueprint for future developments in terms of setting those sustainability bars yeah i think i think definitely i mean i i think in my mind this is the this is the cleverest scheme we've done and i think i do think particularly i mean there's lots of things we've done and you learn on every development and and you know the you can never say this will be the best we've ever because hopefully the next time we'll do something better again but but i think um it certainly has had a fair a kind of a quantum leap in thinking around sustainability in my mind. And I think, um, you know, particularly around how we use energy, particularly around how it creates energy. And I think the, um, I think that for me, this project has, even though I hope we can always do better next time, I I, I definitely think that this has been a bit of a quantum leap from where we were to where we're, where we're going. Um, and I think that, um, you know, we're we're very proud of what it's going to achieve. You know, we're still aiming to achieve that during the 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 life of the project. That um, uh, um, once the project is finished, that we'll be able to achieve uh, carbon neutral status uh, for the, the the management of the, the building. That's when I say we're aiming to achieve that. That's still going to be subject to things like how we manage the building. So that'll be something that we're striving for. But it's certainly achievable on this project. Whereas I don't think I could ever have said that for any other project we've ever developed. Um, so yeah, I think um, it definitely ha- is. It has made a big jump um, technically in terms of what it's how it's performing, and I think that um, you know we'll always want to do better. You know we'll always want to achieve more. But I think it's um, you, you you know it's it's very proud to have seen how far this has come uh, from from where we were. That was Ballymore's Group Managing Director, John Mulryan, talking about how the family company is striving to set new sustainable standards with Mill Harbour. And that's also all we have time for in this week's deep dive into sustainable urban design. We'll be back next week with a look at mobility in cities and the importance of a balanced transport strategy in creating vibrant, bustling, but decongested urban centres. If you want to hear more about urban innovation, please do like and subscribe to the podcast on your provider. And of course, we would love it if you shared the series with your family, friends and colleagues. You can find more details of all of our episodes and about Ballymore's new development at Mill Harbour itself in the show notes that accompany this episode. I've been your host, Jonathan Openshaw, and thanks again for tuning in.